I would like to introduce our speaker for the evening. Uh, we have Bob Dolgan with us. Uh, Bob created his first film, Monty and Rose, as a volunteer plover monitor in Chicago in 2019. He is the founder of Turnstone Strategies, a marketing and communications business. And Bob is also a past board member of the Chicago Ornithological Society. Bob writes the This Week in Birding newsletter, which is published twice each week. He's written in the past for the Chicago Tribune, the Cleveland Plain Dealer, the Chicago Reader, Chicago Wilderness, Richmond Times Dispatch, and the St. Louis Post Dispatch. Bob earned his BA from Kenyon College and his MBA from Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University. So it's my extreme pleasure to introduce you, Bob Dogan. Bob, the floor is all yours. All right. Uh, well, thank thank you so much, Dennis. I'm thrilled to. Uh, bring the story to Peoria. This is our first uh, screening that's in Illinois, but outside of the Chicago area. So uh, I'm 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 excited about this as a person who, who loves to bird all over the state. I um, I'm going to switch over to uh, just a few slides, and uh, and just by way of introduction, and then we'll go right right into the film. And as Dennis mentioned, we'll have a Q and A uh, afterwards. So um, let me just make sure I can share my screen. And okay. So uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about where this story takes place. Uh, a lot of people know about Montrose Point and uh, the uh, incredible uh, migrant trap that it is. And this just shows a, a map uh, of Chicago. You've got kind of the downtown area and the little white circle is around Montrose Point, in case you're not familiar with it. It juts out into the lake, which uh, makes it an ideal stopover point for birds that are flying out over the lake during migration. And they, they come and land and they find uh, some, some room there for shelter, uh, for, for food. And so it's it's this funnel. It's just a, a migrant trap that juts out into Lake Michigan, and this just gives you a closer look at it. Um, it the uh, where the plovers nested. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse or not, but um, is sort of right in the in the middle here in the sandy. There's this big black or dark sort of splotch, and it, it's kind of just south of that splotch. Um, and that's a dune area. There's kind of two main uh, areas, sort of uh, bird bird habitat areas. And one is a dune area, and the other is this more upland area called the Montrose Point Bird Sanctuary that has more mixed habitat. Uh, it has has some meadow. It has has a very small woodland. Um, has shrubs. So uh, we know Montrose Point to be this incredible migrant uh, locale, and th this shows some of the data that backs us up. Um, these are just a selection of some of the uh, top um, top locations for migration in sort of eastern North America, and this is actually a little bit out of date. Montrose Point has since topped uh, 350 total species, um, but 346 species have been seen at Montrose Point, primarily migratory, pr probably the number of breeding species you could say is about two dozen at, at, at most. Um, so it was quite a surprise when I and others were out at Montrose Point in uh, the spring of 2019 and lo and behold um, piping plovers show up which wasn't all that unusual but they show up and they decide to uh, start scraping nests and it's a male and a female um, at the time they were not Monty and Rose they were just two piping plovers that, that arrived at Montrose Beach. And um, the story just unfolds from there. Um, so this just gives uh, some background on piping plovers. If you're uh, not that familiar with the species, um, there are 65 to 70 nesting pairs on the Great Lakes. There's also a large population, uh, at least a thousand or two on the Atlantic coast and about the same amount uh, over in the Great Plains up in the Missouri River Valley. Um, these are relatively small birds. Uh, they're, they're between the size of, say, a sparrow and, and a robin. Um, the habitats 
you might not be surprised that shorebirds like to be around water. Uh, and their diet consists of um, invertebrates and um, whatever they can find in these sort of um, these watery areas that they call home. Um, they, they do, they, you're going to get a close up view of some nest scrapes. <laughs> the, the nest is nothing more than a very shallow uh, half inch uh, scrape in the sand. And um, they do come back to where they've had breeding success. And they tend to forage in these sort of standing water bodies uh, like, like those that we have at Montrose Beach. And uh, like their uh, plover, uh, plover family member, killdeer, uh, they also use a broken wing display to distract predators. So uh, there's a lot about piping plovers. There's a lot, they're just, a, I find them a fascinating species. Of course, I am biased, but um, you'll get a good look at them. And I think in the next you know, 23 minutes, it's not a long film, um, you'll get a good sense of these birds and, and this story. And everything in this the film is from June of 2019 through August 2019. And I'll come back uh, afterwards with an update on the birds. And um, we even actually have some uh, almost breaking news to share uh, about, uh, about Chicago's piping plovers that, that I'll provide afterwards as well. So I'm just going to flip over to uh, my uh, video. When people first saw the plovers starting to make little scratches in the sands, and then people said, well, maybe they will nest here. And we said, yes. Well, I remember when I first read the news, I honestly couldn't believe it at first. These birds obviously saw something uh, in, in this patch of beach that was suitable for their nesting habitat. And so that's where they decided to uh, stake their claim. Well, it was like, oh my goodness, will they survive? <laughs> you know, will they be able to, to fledge on such a highly used and active beach? And I didn't know how to react, whether it was excitement as, as well. I know the reality of it and the challenges and just recognizing the juxtaposition of this speech. I wasn't sure whether it was a, a naivete that, that I appreciated that, sure, we'll, we'll see how this goes. For them to pick a spot where it wasn't going to conflict with humans was basically impossible. So the first thing that went uh, through my mind is we have to protect these nests. And remember, at the time, there was no enclosure. It was just, um, you know, open to anyone uh, to walk around. That first location that the plovers chose was, from a people standpoint, a crazy location. Monty had actually uh, done his goose stepping and was approaching uh, rows. And so we knew that, that mating was going to be uh, very, very shortly. I was very concerned with the, you know, just how busy this beach is. And when I learned that, that they had nested in an area prone to flooding, I was, I was very worried. On June 12, I came. Rose was on the nest. You know, the four eggs had been laid. And, and everything looked so peaceful. It looked like we were going to have um, a success, successful nesting experience. As we started looking at the forecast for the rest of the day, it was high winds, torrential rains, but even more concerning, a strong storm surge from the lake. It, there was already a lot of water on the beach, and there was a good chance that the water would rise to cover the nest. So it's been raining on and off for a couple of hours now, and we're worried about the water 
coming closer to Monty and Rose's nest. One of the fears is that they'll abandon the nest if it goes underwater. And it's likely to rain even more this afternoon, so we're really not sure what will happen. I looked and saw the waves building on, on Lake Michigan. We knew we were in trouble. So they were calling for 35 to 40 mile an hour north winds. It was very distressing to me. The four eggs were removed around 6 p.m. that day. By the next morning, the nest was under a foot of water, so it was definitely the right decision to make. So unfortunately, that first nest had to be salvaged because the lake levels did rise that night and, and washed out. In the initial day or so after the eggs were removed, I didn't actually think that there would be another nest. But then right afterwards, Monty started s scraping nests again. Some of them were close to where the initial nest was. The other ones were much higher on that area of the beach, but closer to the boardwalk. And you could see that Rose didn't want to, come, to go back to that initial nest because it had flooded. There was still hope that they would try again. Just knowing what the topography of the beach and the flooding issues on the beach, I w just wasn't sure where that was gonna happen again. And then one day we realized that they were interested in the volleyball court area, which is an area that makes so much sense from a nesting standpoint because it's high and dry. In all the storms that we had, that area wasn't underwater. So when, when they actually scraped their final and second nest inside, the roped off area where the bank swallows nest, it looked extremely promising. Way back about 14 years ago, we created some interpretive signs for Montrose Beach Dunes. And this sign right here behind me is our welcome sign up by the sidewalk. And um, in preparing that sign, the, the, the most iconic bird we could think of to put on it was a piping plover. So we've got a picture here. And uh, you know, never in a million years did I dream that these birds would actually show up and nest right practically next to the sign, but in fact, that's what they did. To party or not to party? That is the question facing several groups near the lakefront on the city's north side. Promoters are planning a big music festival on Montrose Beach called Man Beyond the Beach, but the event has drawn opposition from a few local organizations who are concerned about traffic, beach access, and some endangered birds that have recently made the beach home. So we got a request through the Park District from the promoter of the festival to have a meeting to discuss what they could do or how we could, how they could assure that the beach would be appropriately used to do if, if they were to have the Mambi Festival here. And we did meet with them and we got some answers, but we weren't satisfied that the lovers could be appropriately protected. I'd say I'm actually kind of disappointed in that the narrative even became that, you know, the concert versus the birds, because this is something that we've been hearing for decades. And before I was born, this sort of, you know, friendly neighborhood business person versus nature. and. You know, we're, we're in, this is 2019. We, we should be well beyond that narrative. There was no reason that, you know, we couldn't have had both in some capacity. I don't know why the Park District, you know, and then I, I look at them as the real villains in this. They're the real enemy in this. Um, why they were not uh, absolutely adamant about enforcing the protections inherent in the word sanctuary. I got really angry and I went on social media and I, you know, held up a picture that said, move the Mambi at the Beach Festival. Every nesting pair in the population is critical in order to maintain the viability of this population. So the Endangered Species Protection Act that was established in 1973 and with that law comes a lot of federal guidelines and protection 
but we recognized right from the beginning that we didn't want to come in and say, yeah, this, this, the feds are going to come in, the state's going to come in. The first thing we tried to do was work with the park district, work with the local organizations, work with the local volunteers. What can we do to cooperatively work to try to get this plover uh, pair to be successful? were really rooting for this, these plovers to succeed. They wanted to make it, so we started seeing a lot of uh, volunteers email and sign up. And at that point, we really didn't know what the response would be or how many volunteers we would need. We just knew that we wanted to try to cover as much of the daylight hours as possible. People were always stopping by. Most of them were really excited that this, this was happening here. So. I think it speaks well for the efforts of the park district to create natural areas and to maintain them in a way that makes people understand nature a little better. And then there was a call out for a need um, for volunteers and it just really piqued my interest. I didn't know what to expect at first uh, because I'm not a birder per se, uh, so I was a little intimidated by some of the knowledge <laughs> that some of the other volunteers had about, uh, about birds. The reactions were just pure joy. I'm really excited to see the, the birds nesting there. We wanted to make sure that some of the volunteers could focus on the people, educate them about the plovers, show them the plovers in their binoculars or their scopes. I think these birds have been a tremendous, tremendous ambassadors to birding, to birds, to having wildlife within your city. It's, it's a great story of engaging people and bringing them on board. They laid the first egg and then they laid the second egg. And this time, because it was a second clutch, IDNR and uh, Fish and Wildlife Service decided to put the exclosure after the second egg. Usually they like to wait uh, to the third or fourth egg. Incubation started on, um, on June 24th. And that first night, the incubating bird would come off the nest all throughout the night, but we, we couldn't tell what she was coming off or that bird was coming off the nest for. So we actually established a secondary camera that was just a little bit further back so that we could get a broader view of the, the nesting area. And that second camera was quite revealing that all night long there were skunks passing by the nest, there were raccoons passing by the nest. On one occasion there was a stray dog that went running by the nest. And you could just tell that the, the amount of activity at that nest site certainly would have been a nest, nesting failure if that cage hadn't been in place. to really make sure that they survived this environment. I think I was amazed at how quickly they were just out and about. After they hatched and they started moving around, that probably was the most stressful time because basically they're these cute little fluff balls running around, but that's all they can do, run around. They can't fly, you know, their parents can only do so much to defend them. Dogs off leash, even though they're not supposed to be, they're always a problem here. 
Um, obviously, even just like the ATVs and things, the beach combers that are out here every day. So there's, there's just a lot of things, a lot of noise. What we're worried about is not necessarily as much the chicks being afraid of people, but, but stopping to feed. The entire goal of those first few weeks on the beach is for, uh, is for the chicks to feed, 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 gain body fat, gain strength so that they can fly away. With, you know, a hundred and whatever people it was protecting them, I was still concerned for the survival of the chicks. The number of predators, the number of threats just increased uh, many times over uh, as soon as those birds left that cage. Nearby we had the gulls that could very quickly come down, swoop down and then grab a chick and, and fly off with it. Crows that could be passing by, uh, great blue herons, black crowned night herons. Once they hatch they leave the nest and so they wouldn't retreat back to the safety of that cage. Uh, there are known mink in the area, there's foxes in the area, coyotes in the area. And as I was breaking down that one day, uh, putting my scope away, I noticed there was a shape in the flooded area where the plovers had been hanging out, or I last saw them before the sun went down, that wasn't there before. And sure enough, it was a black crowned night heron that had somehow snuck his way into the flooded area uh, without anybody noticing, myself included. And, uh, you know, I've been birding long enough to know that black crowned night herons are incredibly awesome birds and also incredibly merciless. And I have seen what they can do to uh, their prey. So I uh, had to rush out there with a flashlight and flash around and try to get it to fly out of that space. One thing that was absolutely amazing was the two plovers' ability um, to take care of themselves and their chicks. They were seen and photographed chasing gulls, chasing mallards. The two of them ganged up on a great blue heron and chased great blue heron. One day, 12 killdeers came into the enclosed area and the chicks were still here. And Monty went after every single killdeer one at a time. We thought we would have to intervene because the, you know, 12, we thought, oh, that's a huge number of killdeers for one plover to take on. He actually kind of like had a line and would go in a line and move one kill deer after the other closer to the outside of the enclosure until finally they were all outside of the enclosure. It was just masterful. Rose was as ferocious as Monty when she needed to be. So I have pictures of her going after gulls. Boy, it was like karate moves. I mean, those gulls had no chance. They had to leave. On July 28th, I came to Montrose and I asked people whether all three chicks were present and they weren't totally affirmative about it. And I start looking around and, you know, I'm not seeing three chicks. I only see two. So I continue to observe. Eventually, Monty and the two chicks go to the body of water that's within the enclosure and go feeding there. But that one chick is standing totally motionless. The chick standing up and with eyes closed wasn't just normal behavior. Louise gave her authorization to uh, collect the bird and immediately take it to the uh, Lincoln Park Zoo where the curator was set up and uh, had called the, the veterinary group there at the Lincoln Park Zoo. Unfortunately that, that chick did end up passing. The chick that passed away didn't have any outward sign of being hurt or harmed. So there was a question mark as to what had happened to it. And uh, of course that raised concern about could it happen to the other chicks. So we basically doubled up our effort about, you know, watching them, monitoring them. We really fortunately never saw the same signs with the other two chicks. To get to work with the three is just absolutely amazing. It's, it's just been one of the most exciting things I've ever experienced and also incredibly gratifying um, because I know that the reason these birds came to this beach is 
because of the quality of the open beach and also the presence of the dunes, which is the type of um, habitat that they're comfortable in. And literally hundreds and hundreds of people a day were going by this nest and just that opportunity to share this very special event with so many people in Chicago is literally an outdoor classroom. What made them special was that they're an incredible organism that we share this planet with. And we, going forward as a city, as a country, a state, people, whatever you name it, um, it's up to us to you know, give them that space, considering that they didn't have the space because of us. This was a one in the wind column in, in the age of Trump. You know, this is one where uh, the environment won. What, what's happened with Montrose is now is the culmination of a restoration effort that started in the mid-60s. Uh, I guess Mr. Landy and Dr. Beecher, they spearheaded this thing. And native grasses, uh, ridding it of in, in, invasive species. I mean, they've really made a paradise. Um, if these guys were alive to see that there were piping plovers nesting there, they'd be in tears. People and volunteers who have been birders for 20, 30, 40 years who have said this has been their, their most meaningful experience in their birding life. Certainly for me, it was a magical summer. My dream is to have this spread over the whole Great Lakes area and every every small piece of beach that we can have some kind of stewardship program in place should any endangered birds, not just the plovers, uh, choose to nest in these areas. There's so little habitat left for these birds and you know we have to share, share that with them and it's all about educating people how to do that. Hello. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you for the kind words. Um, I'm just going to switch over to a few slides and um, oops, make sure I have them up. There they are. Uh, all right. So as I as I mentioned. Um, we have uh, a very new update uh, regarding uh, regarding the area where the the plovers have nested the past two years. And last week uh, on uh, Wednesday, April seventh, 
it was announced, uh, the park district announced that 3.1 acres would be added to the Montrose Beach Dunes natural area, which um, is the area where the plovers have nested. And um, that it's not, this is a big deal. Three acres may not sound like much, but this is about a 25% increase in, in size for the Montrose Beach Dunes natural area. And as you could see, uh, two years ago, we were fending off even having the concert. So um, for the park district to uh, now look at the area um, as a natural asset more so than uh, a place for uh, for for a big concert is really exciting, and so this um, this news has just come across, and um, I think it's just a, a, a big victory uh, for Chicago natural areas, and, and uh, people here were, were celebrating uh, last week, and I think we're just you know now so ready for Monty and Rose to come back and for them to have more room. Previously, as you could see, there were volleyballs kind of rolling into their nesting area. Um, you had a lot of passersby who just sort of wander into the uh, the nesting area or the, or the feeding area. It just, it was an, a less than an ideal situation. And here we're actually expanding the habitat formally. It will still be open to the public outside of plover season, but um, it, it's still, it's great. And now, now that area is gonna be maintained by, uh, by uh, habitat volunteers and, and by uh, wildlife officials to make sure it's ideal for uh, not just plovers, but all sorts of shorebird species that, that use that area. So it's very exciting. Um, so, and this is a, a look at, at the area in particular uh, that we, uh, we call the floodle, um, the, the flooded area that, uh, that the plovers have found forage in the past two years. And, and again, at least a dozen, maybe two dozen other shorebird species utilize this area um, during the summertime. So where are they now? Uh, Rose um, is uh, down in Florida. Uh, every year, Monty and Rose have gone their separate ways at the end of breeding season. And Rose has been photographed the past two winters uh, at a place called Anclote Key, which is near Tarpon Springs, Florida. So um, here's a photo from December in Monty. Uh, Monty is in Texas. So Monty has been down uh, at a place called Bolivar Flats, which is near Galveston uh, on the Gulf Coast of Texas. And this was not known until he was photographed in January. So um, this was exciting. And this is not an easy place to get to down there in Texas. This is a, um, a, a big, big wildlife refuge. And these are beaches that are that would, um, you know, uh, they make Montrose look like a postage stamp. <laughs> um, and uh, an update, I, I don't have an update on the 2019 chicks. So those chicks, unfortunately, they were unbanded and we have not heard back from them, but the, the 2020 chicks, we do have an update. Esperanza, Hazel and Nish are their names. So they, we had three get to fledging and, um, Here's Esperanza with bands on, on, on their legs. And, um, and so uh, this was really exciting. The 2020 chicks were banded. So we're gonna know more about their whereabouts. Let's, um, well, we already know a little bit about their wintering whereabouts, but uh, in summer we'll know soon too, hopefully. Um, but, but here's Hazel down in Georgia uh, last fall. Uh, Hazel was photographed and um, uh, let's see, Esperanza was near there also. And uh, Nish, the third one, was down in Florida near uh, near Rose, actually. So uh, that just is a little update, but I'm glad to you know provide more information. If you have any questions, glad to answer any questions you have. Um, if it has to do with plover uh, biology, I'll, I'll do my best to answer. Um, has anything to do with their story, I'm pretty good at um, at, at telling you at least the um, uh, details of their story, um, having been immersed in this for almost two years. Um, and here's uh, information as to where to stay in touch. I'd, I'd love to um, be connected with you and you can connect with me through these uh, websites. And um, I'll mention my newsletter, This Week in Birding, if you'd like to subscribe uh, to that. It's a free newsletter that, uh, that Dennis had mentioned. I, I write that 
twice a week. So um, thank you so much for the opportunity and I'll just uh, pause my share and I'm glad to take any questions. The first question that came about is, how are the chicks caught to ban them? <laughs> um, so uh, from what I've seen, they um, it, it, it's not a very scientific <laughs> process. It's a lot of herding of chicks uh, together and the um, literally the 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 folks who do that, the, um, the the people with the Great Lakes Piping Plover Recovery Effort, which is this amazing project based out of um, the University of Minnesota that also has a site with the University of Michigan. They have these, um, I, I don't know what the name is for these devices, but they have um, something they can put over uh, the chicks, but they do have to sort of just herd them together um, via people, <laughs> um, just, just people crowding around them. And, and then they, they're able to, um, uh, to put a, a, a type of hood sort of over, over them temporarily, and then they can uh, uh, you know, take hold of the chicks and affix the uh, bands onto their legs. So, um, but it, it looks like it can be a challenging process. I've not been present for it, but um, that's, that's what I've seen. <laughs> okay. Where in Georgia did the 2020 chicks go? Yeah, so they were, um, I, I think it's called Cumberland Island uh, Seashore or National Seashore. It, it's uh, it's a, a barrier island on the Georgia coast. Um, and so uh, that's where a lot of the, um, the Great Lakes uh, piping plovers head. And I think especially the first year uh, plovers and, as well as sort of the South Carolina coast and, and portions of Florida and, and Monty was sort of an outlier being over in Texas. Uh, Great Lakes birds don't, are not many piping plovers winter there generally, um, but that I'm pretty sure it was at Cumberland, um, it's either Cumberland Island uh, Seashore or Cumberland National Seashore. Okay, we've had a number of comments uh, such as a great film, it's fantastic, I loved it. Uh, another question just came about. So will Monty and Rose get back together? The odds are pretty good uh, that they will. Um, that, but you never know. Um, you know, piping plovers don't mate for life. Uh, the birds go their separate ways each year. And up in Michigan, they've certainly had many instances where piping plovers that have been together for a time come back another year and maybe one or the other arrives early and takes up with another plover that's arrived early and they switch, uh, switch mates. Um, uh, that would be quite a, um, <laughs> quite a development here with this very public um, partnership that Monty and Rose have had. Um, but it is, it is possible that they, they wouldn't. I, 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 my guess would be that they will be back together. <laughs> um, and um, this might lead into the next question a little bit, but uh, they did come back. This is what's so remarkable about, you know, bird migration and, and really, in fact, mysterious is that Monty and Rose came back within hours of each other on May 1st of last year um, it, to the beach and uh, after being um, separate for, for the whole winter, they came back on the same day and, and you know, it's just one of those, um, I, I've sort of tried to ask, um, people, even some fairly um, renowned migration experts about that. And they're just, they're, they, that's really just something that it's, it's somewhat still unknown as to how that actually happens. Okay. Um, but they find their way back to the same beach, uh, after, especially after they've had breeding success. That kind of answers one of the next questions is, do the individual plovers typically winter in the same place repeatedly? Yeah, I, I would say the uh, the adults, yes, uh, it does seem to be the case. Um, I know there was a plover nicknamed Bahama Mama that um, was uh, a bird of sort of northern Michigan that uh, actually, actually Bahama Mama is Rose's uh, mom. Uh, spoiler alert, that's going to be in the next film. <laughs> uh, but Bahama Mama um, hatched Rose. Um, would go down to the Bahamas, uh, an island called Abaco, 
uh, each year. So they're, um, yeah, they're, they're uh, on the wintering grounds, yes. But like, I think the one wrinkle in that is that I had heard, I, I, I might have this wrong, but I think the first year plovers tend to go down to the South Carolina, Georgia area, and maybe subsequently end up in places like Florida. Do the bands have GPS or are they just identified by sight? Yeah, it's just by sight. Um, there's no uh, GPS or or um, or any type of chip uh, affixed to the birds. So um, this really relies on there being observers, both on the wintering grounds and in the breeding areas, and then on the amazing, <clears throat> excuse me, efforts of the Great Lakes piping plover folks, who uh, who are keeping tabs on the plovers and and have all the information as to their band combinations. And so they do all have unique band combinations. Um, it can be really hard to see the bands. Even on the best of days at Montrose at times, it can be tricky to figure out uh, band colors on Monty and Rose. Um, so um, it helps to have a really high powered uh, camera or scope, um, but they do have unique band combinations. And then the Atlantic population has its own uh, band combinations. And I, I believe the Great Plains do as well, though I think fewer of those birds are banded. Are the chicks likely to select Montrose for their own nesting? Yeah, that that's somewhat up in the air. So um, it, it it is not known exactly. I think that's the big um, exciting sort of question mark going into this year is where will the chicks uh, turn up. And um, I, I don't know that there is any additional affinity for where they were hatched. So um, from, my, when, from what I've heard, it could be most anywhere. Um, I would have to think, though, Lake Michigan, somewhere around Lake Michigan, either in Michigan, Wisconsin, or Illinois. Um, so, uh, but no, no particular um, likelihood for Montrose. Is there a national band registry? Yes, there. Uh, I want to say it's out of the U.S. Geological Service uh, or survey that um, ha has uh, it, that sort of a, a, is charged with that oversight. But the uh, and and I'm, I'm not sure if the the bands for Monty and Rose and other plovers. I imagine that gets uh, that information must be shared back um, with uh, with folks at the USGS. But there, there is a uh, way, like if you see, say, a Canada goose uh, out, you know, in your local park and take, and it's banded, you can, I believe, submit that information on like a, the USGS or there, there might be a nonprofit organization that's adjacent to that that also helps manage it. So there is a way to get that information if you do find a, a bird that's banded or see one. Yeah. As an FYI, I actually have a link to the Arpuri Audubon website that actually connects a person if they desire to state where they've seen a banded bird. Okay. Um, until we invite you back, how can we see your next film? Um, well, uh, if you st stay in touch with me through social media or on my website, uh, which is montyandrose.net, monty, a n d, rose.net, and I'm still working on the film, but I anticipate it'll be done this year and we'll share it. Um, it it's, I'm hoping it'll be broadcast here in Chicago. It'd be great if it could be all over the state. And um, if not, it'll be, I'm sure we'll have it streaming or, uh, or on DVD. Uh, would love to do kind of an event like, like this one to kick things off and, and have a panel discussion when it does get released. So thank you for asking. I hope, I hope you're able to see it. Are killdeer and plovers always competitive or just when the turf is so limited? Um, I, 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 well, yeah, well, I think where their, um, their range overlaps and where, you know, in, in a particular kind of niche ecosystem like, like the one we have at Montrose, uh, there's going to be some, some type of competition. And in fact, um, it, it, got, got, it was worse uh, last year than the year before. Um, there were a lot of um, turf battles between Monty and Rose and um, and a killdeer family uh, over on that floodle. And, and so um, we didn't get to this in the film, but 
uh, the um, lead researcher with piping pole recovery effort, Dr. Cuthbert out of Minnesota, she she uh, was really concerned when she heard about the kill deer proximity to Montean Rose because uh, you know you wouldn't think a kill deer is like predators or anything, but they they can be aggressive and they can take a, a piping plover chick, um, and so that's uh, that, that was a big worry. And kill deer have been um, a, a a definite subplot throughout the past two years, and that they've um, they've they've just posed a lot of issues. I'm not sure that on some of the more remote beaches where the bulk of the piping plover population is, I don't think that kill deer are probably as big an issue. I think they're and, and throughout the range, there there are there are more predatory predatory birds like like merlins and uh, peregrine falcons that are that are worries. <laughs> um, but but yeah, the um, the the turf battles with killdeer have been. I think they've been particularly pronounced in a sort of compact area like that at Montrose. Any idea what the piping plover lifespan typically would be? <laughs> um, I think it, it's. You know, around seven years is what I've heard is is a pretty good uh, average. Um, there have been, I think there was one plover that might have made it to about fifteen uh, up in Michigan. So, um, so we're we're hopeful. Montean rose were hatched in twenty seventeen, so they're um, they're just turn going to be turning four. <laughs> um, so, uh, so they hopefully they they have a few years. Uh, to come, but we know it's a tenuous existence out there, and they have, you know, a long flight uh, to to uh, to their wintering grounds and back each year. But um, but you know, the monitors are fierce protectors, man. They they just they'll go out and you maybe got some of that sense of this in the film, but they they'll go in and intervene when the gulls are uh, getting aggressive or or the kill deer and. Um, and so hopefully we're able to protect them. But one of the funny things about last year was with uh, the beach was actually closed to, to the public and only a few monitors were out there, but we had a lot more predators around just in terms of, um, you know, I was there on a couple occasions where I saw peregrine falcons. Um, there were more, more, there was more activity at night, kind of um, just more wildlife out and about with fewer people around. So. Um, so it was it was a different a different year, um, but Monty and Rose are also more experienced now as parents, and and I think they um, chose a better nest site last year. It wasn't at risk of flooding. It was higher up on the beach, and and so um, so hopefully nesting success just becomes the norm. Well, as people have started running out of questions, I will make one comment on my own. About halfway through the film, I noticed that I was smiling, and I think it's been rare. For me to actually smile from watching something on television or doing a presentation recently. So uh, Thanks. my hat's off to Thank you, you for that. that. Thank you. Another Thank person you. asked, perhaps I missed this, but how did you choose the name Monty and Rose? Yes, we get this question a lot. So they're named after Montrose. Um, Mont, Mont Rose, oh. <laughs> Monty and Rose. <laughs> and we, we are almost going to address that in the film, but didn't quite get to it. Um, but it's one of those things, it it's, takes takes a second. Um, so that, and that was uh, Tamima Itani, who's featured in the film prominently and uh, is is our plover mother and, and, uh, and super duper organizer. She called them Monty and Rose very early on because they're, uh, otherwise we were referring to them by their uh, leg bands, which got to be kind of kind of cumbersome to always be talking about those. So that, that's where the nickname, uh, that's where the names came from. Thank you for asking. Yes, it seems so obvious now that we think, <laughs> now I guess that's the difference between people that live in Peoria versus people that live around the Chicago area. <laughs> no, we, well, we have people who uh, know Montrose well and, and haven't figured it out yet, so. <laughs> Well, are there any other questions? Uh, if, any, if anyone desires to, you can always unmute yourself. One person said, I'm from the Chicago area and I got it right away, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, um, it, the funny thing is, so Monty and Rose had nested in Waukegan uh, in 2018. So that's like a, a little, another chapter in the story we're gonna hopefully get to 
Um, and and there's there's some jokes that people have made, like if they had stuck around Waukegan, they would have been Wally and Egan or Wally and Keegan, but um, <laughs> that that wasn't the case. Um, but maybe but I, I could see this kind of being a theme if um, if say some some other plovers show up in Waukegan, um, which by the way it's um, they've got an amazing uh, natural area there on the lakefront, and hopefully piping plovers um, do turn up there. I have sort of um, uh, quietly I'm hoping one of the chicks turns up over in Waukegan because the the, the birders up there would would be delighted um, to uh, to to have plovers back. Well, another question that came in, has Peoria ever seen any plovers? I don't know the answer to that myself, but anyone, you have the ability to unmute yourself if you'd like to answer that one. Yeah, we. I saw one in um, uh, Livingston County a few years ago. Okay. Not Peoria County, but Livingston County, which is east of Peoria. What kind of a uh, place was that? Like what kind of habitat or? Yeah, it was just a temporary ephemeral wetland, you know, a floodle uh, that showed up and they were there, or there was one individual there maybe um, for a day or two and that was it. Just wow. presumably on their way to the coast. Cool. That's amazing. Well, does anyone else have any questions? So we had a lot of comments on how everyone enjoyed the film immensely. I don't know if I'm, am I unmuted? Yes. Oh, a uh, question about floodle. I like this term, very inventive. <laughs> is it unique to the Montrose area or is this a, a well-known uh, geographic description? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked this question. So, um, uh, I just wrote about this in my, my, my newsletter because it came up on the Illinois Birders Exchanging Thoughts message board in that um, it's really, I think it's more of an Illinois term uh, than anything that, and there aren't many uses of it or as many known uses of it outside of Illinois. And it's these, these like ephemeral uh, wetlands where, you know, it's a, a flooded, flooded area, uh, you know, often in farm fields, but I also see them you know, like around ball fields and uh, and out on the on the beaches, like at Montrose. So I think it's somewhat unique because I I've been yeah we use floodle all the time because we've been we were throwing around the word floodle a lot at Montrose and um, and then actually this made me sort of overjoyed in that uh, the park district when they announced this new habitat they uh, they used the term floodle in their press release although they they misspelled it. Um, which which is okay. I, I I need to get over it, but they spelled it F L O O D E L, and um, it was pretty funny. Um, but but to see that in a press release, I thought was great because it just sort of made it more official. But no, I it's I think it's it's what people were saying on the message board on iBet was like that it was maybe unique to Illinois, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, so. But it's a great term. It's probably it's just easy to to just refer to that. Um, you kind of get you know a sense of what that means just when you hear it. Okay. Well, if anyone has any more questions, they're free to ask right now. But on behalf of the Peoria Audubon Society, we really appreciate your taking the time to uh, speak with us with regards to the, the plapping plovers in Chicago, as well as sharing your film. So. Uh, if we were in a person. Hey, Dennis, Dennis, I put a map up of the uh, piping plover spottings along the Illinois River. It's in a file in the in the chat for people that are interested. Just okay. did an e eBird explore. So. eBird is a very good resource for trying to find out where piping plovers have been seen locally as well as uh, the rest of the US. OK, if anyone has any more questions, this is your last chance. So. We all thank you very much, Bob. We uh, wish you well, and uh, we wish more success to Monty and Rose. So, yeah, thank come you up very and much. Uh, come up and visit.
uh, visit sometime. Uh, but thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to share the story with you. And um, thanks for all the great questions and, and the kind words too. And thank you, Dennis. <laughs>